you were a Palestinian, you would regard it as the moral thing to resist. Or no? if I was a Jew, I would regard it as the moral thing to exterminate the Palestinian, right? But what kind of morals would you have? I think as Stalin... Well, to so, but, but this is why I'm asking <laughs> for kind of the epistemology here. And yeah. I'm not asking for anything too precise, yeah. right? Kind of the general idea. I don't actually understand what the moral proposition of communism is, and Hegel certainly is not offering one. Okay. So what is it? What is the morality? I think. Of I think. Uh, you know. Look. Uh, the, the industries that collateralize the uh, loans that creditors mm -hmm. give out. This is oil. This is energy. And on that count, you're yeah, right. But, this and, is what the oil back industry to does. Force doctrine. Right. Yeah. Who gives a how much debt you have when you have the most powerful military on planet Earth with a navy yeah. that can say, "Oh, we'll just blow you up." But who owns the who owns that military? Uh, the, well, the United States government owns well, it and deploys well, it. But the, but if the government is in debt and and fifty percent of my income taxes mm -hmm. are going to servicing the interest on the national debt, then our government is clearly occupied and controlled by the private interest. By who? By the private interest. And who are they? The international financial uh, institutions, the bankers. And who owns them? <laughs> Uh, that's the thing. There's no individual that owns it. It's an institution that is set aside and, ha and is the, the basis, the purport of this institution. If you had to give a representation yeah. between a people group yeah. of who owns most of these banking institutions, yeah. who would it be? You think it's the Jews? I'm asking you. I don't think it is. I, I've looked up the numbers. I've looked up the names. I've studied this. I've had my people study it. We do not find any case where the ruling capitalist class is majority Jewish. Now, are there is there over representation relative to their uh, population? Of course, yes. Is that because though, Haas? But there's no, sure there's no, there is clear. no one ethnic group or ethnic or religious group. I want to make sure that, I'm totally clear yeah, here. Yeah. But, okay. Real quick, I just want to make sure I'm completely clear here. Yeah. I want to make sure that you're not being biased. Because Bolshevikism, which you believe in, yeah. big C communism, was conducted, orchestrated, and executed by Jews. No, it wasn't. It was. I mean, uh, okay. Well, if it, it if it was conducted and orchestrated by Jews, why is it that only for two years, and not even two years, just like a specific months within a year, was the Politburo even half Jewish? For the all-round majority of the existence of the party, mm -hmm. Jews were a minority in, at every level and at every rank of a position you can so, have. So when you take a whole, when yeah. you take a whole of an organization, right. you can have people who over-represent different key positions inside of an organization. If okay. they over-represent these key positions, they're still in positions of authority. Over-representation talking... doesn't imply control. That's just relative to your population. You, that's true, unless we have the positions of which they're in control. So, Such as which? So, well, so, for instance, inside of a bank, right, yeah. you would look at who are the policy makers. Yeah. Inside of government, you would look at the same thing. Who are the people who right. actually... So in the Bolshevik the Party, stops who, with could, them. who controlled everything in the Bolshevik Party then? Who? You tell me. Wasn't Jews. Well, who was it? Well, okay, we have Stalin as the general secretary. He's not a Jew. The only the, the major Jew is Lazar Kaganovich, who's the commissar of transportation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that doesn't sound like having an office or an administrative position where you're like uh, controlling everything or controlling everyone. All of the main <laughs> positions of executive control. I mean, for for a one for a few years, you had an NKVD chief. Who was Jewish? Mm -hmm. That was Yagoda, right? What about well? What a after Yagoda, he gets purged, he gets shot. So clearly, <laughs> he wasn't the boss. Lenin wasn't Jewish. Okay, uh, what about Trotsky? Trotsky was killed. Okay, and he was uh, kicked out in 1926. He well, wasn't was even a Bolshevik. Was he Jewish? Trotsky was a Jew, yeah, but Trotsky he was, was not. Jewish. He was not a Bolshevik. The thought leaders, yeah. right? He's not the a thought, thought leader. The thought leaders, yeah, definitely. We're Jewish. No. Nope, yes. No. Nope. Yeah. I let can me, give me a list. I, I'll, I'll explain. The, give me the list. I'll explain the history to you. Okay. Explain. Trotsky. The Bolshevik Party existed for decades. I understand. Mm -hmm. That was Lenin. That was Stalin. These were the OG Bolsheviks. They were a group that stuck together. Right. Trotsky was never part of this group. Trotsky latched on to the revolution at the last moment in 1917, and because of his uh, pledging of support and enthusiasm, the Bolsheviks let this guy in. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now. Uh, when all is said and done, the civil war is over. Trotsky is trying to usurp power from the Bolsheviks. Stalin has to come and say, you're not one of us. You weren't an OG. You know, you weren't there with us in the very beginning. So Trotsky wasn't a Bolshevik, and he was kicked out in 1926, shortly after the state itself was created. So to say that Trotsky was a thought leader of the Bolsheviks, A, he's not even really a Bolshevik. B, he wasn't in all a significant influence on the formation of the Soviet state, mm -hmm. uh, because he was kicked out in 1926. Okay. Let me concede the point that it wasn't.
And then we'll fast forward to modernity yeah. when you're trying to talk about these issues which communism is going to solve. When yeah. you're asking about the same thing, who is in these key points? Who is in these key demographics? Who? Who, in terms of their ethnicity, or what do you mean? Well, I'm asking... The just, capitalist class. Yeah, so, so who's in control of the means of production of information? Let's start with that. Uh, the banks. <laughs> it's really going to come down to the financial institutions. Let's talk about the media itself. Same thing. Okay. No, 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 there is, is no... Is there any overrepresentation? Yeah, yeah. Look, look. There's so many different groups with overrepresentation, though. Episcop Episcopalans have overrepresentation. As a matter of fact, yeah. But but if yeah. you look at a percentage which is narrow, yeah, the narrower the percentage gets, the more the overrepresentation becomes. The reason the reason I'm hesitant to uh, focus that it's the Jews, the Jews, Jews, because the majority of I didn't Jews say that. Yeah, yeah. But the majority of the Jews are not in power, and the majority of the people in power are not Jews. Now, if there's a relationship of overrepresentation relative to their population, mm -hmm. that's fine. We could talk about that and what the causes of that are. But that overrepresentation doesn't prove they control it. It just proves that they're overrepresented. That's yeah, it. Yeah, but but so what would be the proof that you control the thing? The proof, it's it's in the very nature by which your power over the thing is executed, sure. and it's all superficial. Right. There's a, capital, oh, wait, 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 there's yeah. a capitalist system in we which be, all of the wealth... We need to be super clear yeah. here. We need to be super clear. Yeah. I need to know, Yeah. how do I know if you're in charge of a thing? How do I know that? You will know them by their fruits. Right, you know them by their fruits. Right, right. okay, so all we need is critical positions. That's it. Okay. The critical position, the decision-making, this type of thing. Okay. That's how you know. And the who's only in consistent thing, right? variable, the only consistent variable, as far as how power has been executed and has been used, right? Let's just talk about the last fifty years, mm -hmm. is to enrich the capitalist class. That's the only constant variable. Is it to enrich the Jews? Well, why are there all these poor Jews in New York that are dirt poor that have literally nothing that are Orthodox Jews? Why are they literally uh, broke, you know? Why are there so many Jews that are broke? It's clearly not for the benefit of... By the way, nothing has been a bigger disaster for the Jews, if you ask me, than Israel itself. Okay, the, is, the, the Zionist project has been a total failure and a big disaster. And whose interest was the Zionist yeah, but, project? Yeah, hang on, let's, let's move back a little bit. Yeah. What the fuck would, oh, there's some poor Jews in New York have to do with anything that we're talking about when because it comes the to the Because the only consistent key variable, grouping. know them by their fruits, enriching mm -hmm. the ruling financial class. That's the only consistent variable. Okay, so, so you can have poor people who are in New York, who are whatever ethnicity. Yeah. I still don't understand what that would have to do if you have an overrepresentation of certain groups in keyed in positions. Well, what what are they doing in those positions? On behalf of whose interests? What are they their what are they interests. using their power to do their, to fulfill they, to enrich themselves? There you go. Yeah. So that's the capitalist class. It doesn't matter if they're Jewish, it doesn't yeah, matter I don't, if I don't believe that if you were a communist that you couldn't do the exact same thing. That you couldn't enrich so yourself. Show the, show the examples though. Of communists enriching themselves? Yes. Did did Stalin die poor? Absolutely. He died <laughs> yeah, with died nothing. Poor. He died with a pipe. He died with his uh, his uh, his shirt and his suit. And uh -huh. I think he had one small cabin in the woods somewhere. And that's all he had. Oh. Look it up. Okay. He had nothing. Mm -hmm. He had no bank accounts. He had no wealth. Well, he literally he had nothing. He could just get whatever the hell he wanted when he wanted it. What evidence is there that Stalin was living a luxurious life? Even Khrushchev in his memoirs, Khrushchev mm -hmm. would complain and say, Stalin, you know, he's so hard on us. This is in the 1930s. He makes us eat porridge every night. We're never able to eat nice food. He makes us live austere, ascetic lives. This is the nature yeah, so and what? character of Stalin. <laughs> so what? So he makes you eat porridge? This somehow means that he doesn't have complete and total unilateral control of this nation. He clearly did. Where is the proof that he is... Uh, he is using power to aggrandize himself and uh, Stal luxuriously. You mean the the proof that Stalin is what? He's utilizing the state's resources to enrich himself? Yeah, where's the proof? Yeah, he's in charge of the state. Could he have whatever he wants when so he wants it? Stalin is someone who fully put himself in the service of his country and his people. Fully. Not even 1% was dedicated to himself. Where is the evidence of that 1%? I'm, I'm trying to be clear here. Yeah. What is it that you're asking me? Stalin was Stalin not the head of the state of Russia? Yes, he was. Okay. A, he, yes, could Stalin get whatever the hell he wanted whenever he wanted it? Um, could he? I mean, could he abuse his powers? You're saying maybe, but had he abused his power, there would have when been consequences. You have, when you're in a position yeah. of total unilateral yeah. control, 
whatever your preferences are he then. didn't he didn't even the CIA released a memo in the 1950s that said it's a big myth that Stalin has total control he doesn't he's accountable to his party he's actually accountable to his party <laughs> unless he wanted to kill him the <laughs> he could only kill people in the party if he had a consensus of the party that's the thing he it's not just that Stalin didn't like this guy he had him killed it's a big okay. nonsense myth so so Stalin who is the unilateral leader you're saying okay so would you say that Kim Jong Un or Kim Jong Il, same thing. That the problem is we have an information blackout because all we get from North Korea are bullshit stories, like Yenmi Park mm -hmm. and all. We don't. We have an information blackout. The reason we know uh, as much as we know about Stalin's Soviet Union right now is because when the Soviet Union collapsed, the archives opened up, so we can actually look and see about how it was working and what was going on. We have CIA stuff that was leaked, all this kind of stuff. North Korea, there's not a lot of information, and the only information we do seem to be getting is bullshit. You know. Yeah, but, the, well, so so let's move back again. When you're talking about North Korea, you say, okay, there's an information blackout. What I'm asking you specifically, though, you say Stalin has never uh, used his position of power to enrich himself. Where's the evidence of that? Yeah. So when he's in service to the people, what is he doing as part of this service? What is it? Leading them. He does what Leading a leader them does. Leading doing what? What do you think a leader does on a day-to-day task? I'm asking you, tasks? what is Stalin doing here as the position He is of attending to the bit and overseeing the business of the state, mm -hmm. making sure that the plan, the five-year plans are being executed mm -hmm. correctly, attending and being sent. He's literally reading uh, the letters of ordinary people that are being sent on a regular basis to him. He's actually reading these things and replying. He's overseeing the people that are under him, making sure that they're doing their job. He's uh, consulting with all the different departments of the state in order to make sure that everything... And this is how, what leaders do. How many people died under his reign due to the massive famine, which was caused? The one in 32, 33, yeah. where there was where there was a combination of one of the biggest droughts in their history, and there is proof that the uh, the Kulak class was destroying and burning grain as a form There's of political resistance. There's also massive proof that they were trying to reallocate and redistribute. Uh, these supplies and they were they were literally putting them in grain houses and in storage units and things like this They were rotting away because they were trying to distribute equally it, the these famine types listen, of supplies. the famine the famine was a disaster But let's actually place things into context sure real quick this, guys. Yeah, <clears throat> we've been going 35 minutes on this topic uh, And I I didn't want to stop anything because you guys were going but uh you know what we'll do? We'll take a quick break, and then I'll read some chats, and then we'll go back into this, and we'll talk sure. about the famine and, sure. and Stalin. Sure, Two other questions yeah. keep going. I do, I do want to get into, um, and I've been, been kind yeah. of fleshing this out, pulling yeah. out the dialogue so I understand exactly what your position is. I'd finally like to get into the moral position of communism. But not the famine, because I kind of want to... Yeah, we can get to that, yeah, yeah. But, but can we start with the moral position of communism, and then we can dive into the famine portion. Yeah. That's sure, where we left sure, off was the famine, sure. but wherever you yeah, guys yeah, want yeah. to start. Yeah, I'm cool yeah. with the moral stuff. Moral I, just want to make, I want to make sure that we don't bypass it because it's, a, it's an elongated sure, conversation. Sure. I'm going to start the timer anyway, just to, so I know <laughs> yeah. it, but you guys go ahead. Take it away. Yeah, so, so my biggest issue here is the reconciliation. So I'll concede a few points. There's no doubt that, that uh, Haas knows far more about communism and communist history than me. He should, right? He's not an orthodox apologist, for instance, nor... Uh, so I expect that he knows inside of his domain more than I do about X thing. But it still has to, from his view, logically add up to two things. One, the practical application, which I can concede even there could be some practicality to communism. But I need to know the moral implication. Mm -hmm. And this is what we're diving into is the moral implication. And I need to know what you're basing this on other than your own intuition. And if there is something external to your own intuition uh, and why we should follow it. I would say, and I'm going to going to posit this, that people themselves need to have something which is higher than them to move towards. I think that you would say the same thing with the state, right? But History, yeah. when, it, when it comes to decadence, Right? How does how's communism preventing this except with the barrel of a gun versus uh, argumentation and the ethics around argumentation that you find from religion and theology? And I'd like to dive into the moral discussion of that. You know, I think yeah, it's a good question. I think that uh, you know, I reject 
the separation of morality from the other spheres of this, you know, the division of labor, so to speak. I think that a human existence, inclusive of its economic reality, inclusive of its social and political reality, and its historical reality, is infused with the moral. The moral has significance for every historical uh, era, for every historical situation we find ourselves in. So, for example, we're, we don't have to get into the, the conflict itself, but just an example, you can disagree. Agree. I think, for example, the question of morality for a Palestinian, it's not a question of propositional logic. It's not a question of uh, reasoning. It is based in a concrete historical circumstance in which their people are being occupied by a foreign aggressor. And it is, yes, maybe it's a matter of intuition, but it's the clear moral path which is to resist, right? So history is riddled with situations like this. I would argue that every instance of um, the, uh, the, uh, the emergence of prophets, biblical prophets historically, they are, um, they're, they're giving people a message, but the message is not being justified to them on the basis of propositional logic. It's not being justified on the basis yeah, I'm of not asking for, a rational um, authority. I'm not asking it for It makes sense logic. in the time that it's in, and people mm -hmm. heed the call because they receive it as something that's making sense of the injustice of yeah, the year but, other but living there's in. many things here which uh, which would make sense even in this situation which could be superior to picking a side mm -hmm. for instance why do i care if jews and palestinians kill each other fuck them right what do i care yeah but if you were a palestinian you would regard it as the moral thing to resist or no? if i was a jew i would regard it as the moral thing to exterminate the palestinian right but what kind of morals would you have i think as stalin well, to so, but, but this is why i'm asking <laughs> for kind of the epistemology here yeah. I'm not asking for anything too precise, yeah. right? Kind of the general idea. I don't actually understand what the moral proposition of communism is, and Hegel certainly is not offering one. Okay. So what is it? What is the morality I think, of I think, communism? Uh, you know, look, I don't want to, I'm not dodging the question, this is a direct response. Yeah. Putin said that the moral code for communist builders, was uh, a, a document the Communist Party of the Soviet Union released, precisely to answer this question, he says the same thing as the Bible. It's the same thing. It's this not is what the Putin same said. Thing. Well, in my view, the morality of the communist is not a morality separated from the one that is actually ingratiated and is based in the historical existence of the people through the Bible, through the Quran, through the Confucianism in China, for example. The, the, the communism communists were doesn't, killing the Christians. They weren't, they weren't elevating communism, them. Communism, we can get into that, but communism doesn't propose creating a morality from scratch. We regard the real moral sensibilities of the people as they actually exist, as they've been inherited yeah, and passed down by generations. What are those moral? Like, what is the moral thing we should we be are, moving to? We are no longer. Uh, that question is a descriptive question. It's not a propositional one. It's not uh, what what should it be. It's what is it. It's a question of analysis. So, for example, we can say the morality. It's also a question of the analysis. Hang, of, hang on, hang on. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I don't mean to cut in. I want to clarify though. Yeah. Yeah, there's a descriptor, that's true, but we're looking at an is and an ought here, it's all the same. Yeah. So you say, okay, we can adopt to yeah. the description of whatever the morality is. Mm -hmm. Clearly, you're not going to adopt the the prescription of the morality of like putting someone on a pyramid, cutting out their heart, holding yeah. it up to the sun god. You would yeah. say, no, nope, we're not doing that. But, but but human beings did do that for a long period. Yeah, but of that history. doesn't mean communism would endorse that. No, absolutely so, so not. So it's moving towards some because moral communism. Something is not something that is separating itself from the development of history. It's the culmination of history. We're not here to reject the Bible and reject the religious traditions of the people. Then, then what is your, your grounding to, to say you can't take them on top of pyramids and cut their hearts out? The, 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 why does there need to be a grounding for that? Why does there need to be a... And by grounding, by the way, you're mm -hmm. talking about propositional logic. You're talking about something that is basically this, the, the, the self-consistency of a concept. Well, we do need to know which I, why... I regard that, well, but yeah, I regard I, that as an impossible... We're moving yeah. towards something. The, the foundation of morality does not lie in logic. The foundation of morality lies in existence. It lies in the real existence of people uh, struggling to make sense of that existence in relation not only to themselves, Themselves, but toward others and toward the uh, well, well, natural on, world. On, Oz, let's back up a little bit. Yeah. Yes, I will agree that there's something far more expressive about what morality is than propositional logic or logic of any kind can yeah. really ever express. The external that you're talking about. Yeah. But you should still be able to give me a general idea of what it is communism, the moral descriptions of communism are moving towards. So in Christianity, for instance, yeah. let me give you the example. Mm-hmm. Inside of your worldview, isn't it true that you believe that it's material conditions, 
right? Which set what men will do, not some sort of ontology which is the man which sets what they will do. Uh, materialism is not about uh, uh, a single directional cause and effect. What man is doing is a material reality. Not, it's not that the material reality is the cause of his actions. The context by yeah. which his actions are suspended in a way that reproduces his real existence is a material so existence. How do you win? So, so if this was a video game called Communism, the game, yeah. what's the win condition? What do you mean? Inside, so if you have a video game, mm -hmm. let's say you have World of Warcraft, yeah. it's going to have its own economy, it's going to have its own, it's going to have its own player base, it's going to have its own everything, right? Uh, it's not reality, but it's like a demi reflection of reality, mm -hmm. I, right? W w so, so what? So inside of the game, yeah. there's going to be a victory condition, uh -huh. right? The victory condition is you know kill this bad guy, right? Ah, oh, you beat the game. Okay. So. So what is communism's answer to beating the game? So the Christian answer is theosis. That's how you win. You beat the game, you become more like Christ, you enter into theosis. This is our what, objective. What does that actually... Hang on, hang on. Yeah. This is what we're moving towards. This is what we want. Mm -hmm. Theosis. That's the victory condition. What's the victory condition inside of communism? What is it? What is the thing that we're moving towards so we know we beat the game? You know, broadly, I would say the overall development of the productive forces and the uh, prosperity and um, uh, well-being of mankind. And how do we know that that is the moral thing to move towards? Uh, probably in terms of population growth and the growth of wealth. So, the growth of wealth? The growth of wealth and the growth of for human beings. For the nation beings. or for the individual? Uh, for for the people, not just for the individual. Of course, not just for the individual. And and how how is it that you Haas describe what is a wealthy person? What is wealth to an individual? Is it money? Is that what you're talking about? Material conditions? I think it it can be it can be recorded objectively. I mean, you uh, by wealth. I'm not just talking about luxury. I'm talking about the the necessities of people to exist. So the growth of a population, for example, mm -hmm. can clearly be an indication that there's an expansion of wealth. It can be, but the poorest people also populate the most now. And they could not survive relative to, you know, they survive. 100... They survive better in, often than the rich who abort their kids and the middle class who abort their but kids. But if, if, if it better. was not for at least a relative degree of the expansion of the overall uh, productive forces and material wealth, they would not be able to survive. They seem to, the poor seem to survive why better has, why than do, the rich do. Then why weren't the rich don't reproduce? Then why weren't there 8 billion people in 1800? Well, so you have, and by the way, we're about to go way less than 8 billion people now. Sure. And there's never been more but wealth. But in 1800, hang we on, couldn't... On. There's we, never been more wealth produced... I agree. ...on planet Earth. But, so, hang on. In 1800, you, on, we on, couldn't on, support bro, that amount. Hang on, let me ask the question. Yeah. You have just contradicted yourself. How could it possibly be that we have now produced more wealth on planet Earth than ever before, but we're moving into a birth rate crisis like we've never seen before? There's no possible way that we're going to be able to reproduce at 8 billion long term. That's fine. No projection But in 1800, 8 billion people could not exist on Earth. Because the material wealth and the productive forces and technology wasn't to well, advance to a sufficient degree to support them. There's also an issue of... It takes X amount of generations to reproduce X amount of people. We don't know exactly when the starting point was. How long do you think human when, beings have been around? When, I don't know. Neither do you. 